How can we train our brains to be more comfortable when confronting change and more adapt at innovation? Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and physicist Dr. Leonard Mladenov shows us how we can. Dr. Mladenov is known for his ability of taking almost incomprehensible subjects and making them accessible to all. With his book, Elastic, he gives us the essential tools to harness flexible thinking in a time of change. Leonard, I don't know, I don't know how many times now it has been, but you're very close, if not the record-setting guest. It's always a pleasure to have you back here, my friend. Well, as always, it's great to be here. I want to start with this book, as I say, is a little different than the others, and that's why we're going to do it in two parts, because there's a first part about how we have to really learn to think about what's going on and why, and, and be able to adapt to the future. And in the second part, you actually show us and tell us how we can do it. So that's what I want to do. I want to explain first the science and the theories behind this. And the first one is, is that no matter what's happening now, we, no matter what technological advances we have, we're having to solve problems today that we never even dealt with 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. That's right, Barry. Our, our lives are changing much faster than ever before, whether it's our work lives where we have to deal with new technologies, new apps that we have to use at work, or new apps we have to use to communicate with our friends. Uh, obviously, our politics are totally topsy-turvy, and all around the world there's tremendous turmoil in politics. Society is changing, uh, some for the good, some for the bad, but very fast. But when times are changing, when you're constantly having to understand new situations, then you have to reframe, you have to learn how to frame the way you're thinking or reframe the way you're thinking, question your assumptions, uh, and adapt. And that's, that's elastic thinking. And that's what this book is about. This book is the reasons why we need to have this elastic thinking and how we can, because without this, and, and, and the interesting thing with elastic thinking that's different from what you said, analog thinking in the, in the past, is it used to be a top-down form of thinking. This is a bottom-up. Explain that because people won't, that's a hard concept to understand. We're always thinking that our mind is telling us what should be done. With elastic thinking, it's almost a more at-rest mind that's telling us what to do. Yeah, so human thought can be put on a spectrum. At one end is logical analytical thinking. That's what they test for in college entrance exams, and that's what a lot of employers look for. That's the kind of thinking where you start with certain premises or assumptions, and then you use the rules of reasoning to get from A to B to C and so on until you've solved your problem or made your decision. And that works really well for problems that have already been framed for you, for problems where you know how to think about it and you just have to use logical analysis to draw conclusions. But at the other end of the spectrum is elastic thinking. Elastic thinking isn't about rules. It isn't about following rules. It's about creating the rules. Elastic thinking tells you how when you reach a new situation, you create the rules that you need to understand it. The assumptions that you need, you, you examine the old assumptions and see whether you need to break them or change them and how you adapt, how you, how you look at things in a new way. So the, 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 at the other end of the spectrum, the logical analytical, that's a top-down kind of uh, thinking. That's what they call it in, in neuroscience and computer science. That's the kind of uh, analysis that happens when you have a CEO or a boss who dictates what you, what you need to do. In your brain, there are structures called uh, executive structures that focus your attention and uh, lead you toward your goals. And that's called top-down thinking because it comes from the top-down, if you think about an org chart. Bottom-up thinking is elastic thinking. Bottom-up thinking is, is, is much different. It, it, it's not militaristic, rule-based, structured thinking. Well, one of the things, though, when you're working with the bottom-up process is you have to allow for failure. There has to be a real tolerance for failure because, as you say, there is no one giving you the instructions. There are no instructions to follow. So you almost have to allow yourself to 
I think even when you worked with Richard Feynman, and, and, and he even described some of his best work was failures. And he loved that because it required the same amount of bottom-up thinking and creative thinking. So in a top-down structure, as you mentioned with the SATs, no failure. You fail and you get a bad grade. In elastic thinking, failures are almost encouraged. Well, yes, because what is really important when you're facing a new situation or trying to solve a novel problem or a problem that people have tried with logical thought and, and always uh, failed at, what's really important is to have ideas that are different and new approaches. And you can't demand in advance, unfortunately, that your new original way of looking at something is going to work or that it's going to be good. Whenever you're, you have sensory input or whenever you're thinking about some particular subject, your brain on an unconscious level is making associations and creating ideas that are related to that. You would drown in a flood of those ideas if they came to your consciousness. So to keep that from happening, your brain has what are called cognitive filters that decide which ideas to let through from your unconscious mind to your conscious mind. And those filters do what is reasonable. They, they let through only the most promising ideas, which are often the most conventional ideas. So one of the keys to elastic thinking, to, to idea generation, originality, uh, is, is to learn how to relax those filters so that more ideas come through, not necessarily the most promising, but not necessarily the most conventional. And then you'll get crazy, silly, stupid ideas, but you also get ideas that maybe at first glance seem like that, but are really, really good and different. Well, you say the real importance of that is because we live in a world now that is really basically comes from our imagination. In our his, you know, history, there was, we basically lived in a natural environment. Now almost everything we do, everything, our residences, everything is from our imagination. So we need our imagination to deal with all the things that are coming up. And even more so, as you say in the book, not only do we need to do this so that we can deal with things, we need to do this so that we can be the innovators of the new order, so to speak. That's right. Every, everything that you encounter in our, in our life, unless you're out camping somewhere, is for the most part a creation of, of a human being, of a human thought. It's an invention, a, a, a table, uh, the idea to put bolts in, cups, the, the chair, the, uh, how to make this, how to weave clothing together. All these are human inventions. Other animals live 99% or more in their pure natural environment, especially animals that are, let's say, non-primate animals. And uh, maybe birds create a nest, but for the most part, animals live out in nature, and humans, for the most part, live in an artificial world. And what's been happening lately is that artificial world, because of the advances in technology and in knowledge is changing more than it ever has before. And so in order to keep up, we, we, need, to be able to, we need to be able to adapt. If we can't change with it and adapt to our new changing environment, then we can get left behind. And that's, that's not just philosophical. I mean, in business, for example, think about it. You're a cab company. You apply logical analytical thinking to get as efficient as possible. You want to make your cab company run really well, right? But that's logical analytical thinking. Meanwhile, Uber comes along and revolutionizes, revolutionizes the way we, we call for a ride, right? And, and if you, as a cab company, don't adapt to that, you're going to get trounced by them. And that's what's happening because the cab companies were basically cartels and they, 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 they weren't nimble and they didn't question assumptions and they didn't take Uber seriously enough soon enough. Encyclopedia Britannica is another example. Uh, think of Wikipedia comes along. Encyclopedia Botanica had certain assumptions behind their business and they were successful for a century, right? The, the least of those assumptions was that it's a book. It could, they could put it online. That's not really what Wikipedia did. What Wikipedia said was, we don't need experts to write these articles. That was one of the really revolutionary things that they did, right? That's what Encyclopedia Britannica didn't, uh, couldn't accept. They came and they questioned the underlying assumptions of the business. Encyclopedia Britannica said, that's a silly idea. That'll never work. They never took it seriously enough. But we see that it does work, and Wikipedia has, repl has replaced them, displaced them. Encyclopedia Britannica had this huge database of articles. If they had been nimble and quick to 
to accept this new assumption and to go with and say maybe this will work, they could have trounced Wikipedia way back at the beginning. They could have put all their stuff online. They could have used exactly the Wikipedia model, opened it up to people, said give us donations instead of selling it, and they would be the Wikipedia of today. But because they couldn't accept that, they couldn't they, they, they didn't question their own assumptions and then someone else came along and did that and then when the other company questioned them they couldn't accept the new assumptions and look where they are now. Well, that's the biggest obstacle we have to face and why we need to use elastic thinking is that we are so entrenched in the way things were that as you use the term neophile and if we're not all or no, neophilia that's what you use. And if we're not all into this mode of neophilia, which is a, a sense of willingness to explore the new and yet at the same time know that when you do, you get rewarded by doing that. Reward is one of the things that you say is from the beginning of time almost. Reward dependence is something that's been in our zeitgeist for almost ever. Well, everything that humans or other animals do, mammals at least, depends on the reward system in their brain, which determines whether they find something satisfying or feel good, and it helps their brains choose their goals, and it motivates uh, organisms. And humans have a gene that makes it rewarding for them to find new things and to explore variety. Uh, about 100,000 years ago, there, there was a great climactic disaster. And most humans died. We were down to, depending on who you believe, dozens or hundreds of uh, individuals. And life was very hard back then. And the ones who survived were the more exploratory ones who were bolder in terms of looking for new food and water sources, moving around more, or had moved around more and knew where they could go to find help. And that became a kind of a, of a genetic filter. And after, after that disaster, humans were much more exploratory. So it's really built into our minds now to be exploratory compared to other species. So a human being in general, if your job is peeling potatoes all day, you'll get bored. A squirrel doesn't mind that as long as it's getting its meals. Well, you used, uh, was it, I'm gonna find, Karl Papa, who said, all life is problem solving. That's really, what this is about, isn't it? It's problem solving the technologies that we need to deal with today, and it's by using innovation to solve the problem. Life is problem solving, and an important part of that is being able to take chances. So this is where we, you, you mentioned fear of failure. So neophilia is, is an, explore, about an exploratory tendency. Now, why not explore? Well, why not is sometimes you, you trip, you fall off a cliff, you run into a predator. There are, there are costs and dangers to exploration, and, and the amount of exploration any individual or, or species wants to do is, is a trade-off between the risks and the, and the benefits of that. And, uh, but you really will get nowhere in innovation or adaptation if you're, if you're afraid to fail, if you're afraid of running into the predator, you just stay home, you, you, you use, if you're an, uh, an animal, you, you, you stick to the, to the status quo and to the, the resources that you have. You never explore and learn where there's other resources. You'll ne therefore never improve your life. And when your resources dwindle, you won't have any alternatives left. So this is very important. You have a term you use called cycle of thinking. And we're gonna get into that in part two real deeply because I think that's a, a, a deep problem that many people have. And the way you say it is therapists tell their patients that the way out of such cycles is to learn to recognize when they are occurring and then stand together to interpret the scripts. Because one of the things you mentioned in the book that a lot of our thinking and a lot of the way we analyze and work is really scripted. and the cycles sometimes can cycle down and really spiral down. That's when it's dangerous. Obviously, if it's cycling up, it's not dangerous. But when it cycles down, you've got to break that cycle. And part of elastic thinking is giving you an ability to see things from that different perspective, from that different point of view. Right, that's a very important element of elastic thinking is not just to be able to 
know how to frame a problem, reframe a problem, or, or, or question your assumptions, but it, it's about being able to adopt a different point of view because quite often your point of view is what gets in the way of solving what's otherwise a trivial problem. I want to go into this, Leonard. You say that the influence of culture is so powerful, it affects even our perception of physical objects. Now, that's hard to imagine that we're seeing something, how is our culture affecting us, but yet you say that is one of the ingrained things we need to break away from. Yeah, you know, we all have, all have a style of thinking, and this varies between individuals. And that's partly based on your own uh, experience and your own genetics, but it's also partly based on the, on the environment that you live in, the human environment that you live in, the culture. And some societies are more rule-oriented. Uh, I lived in Germany for a while, for example, and one of the sayings there was, das macht man nicht in Deutschland, which means we don't do that in Germany. They have a very rigid conception of the rules that they follow. America, on the other hand, is called the Wild West, right, for a good reason, not just back then, but today. We're, we're leaders in innovation. We have startup companies, VCs everywhere funding things. It's a very fluid kind of a place to live, which has its pros and cons because it's somewhat chaotic and, and, and we don't always take care of our people the way we should. In Germany, it's very orderly. They do take care of people, very great social systems, but they're much more conventional. So if you look at the amount of innovation, say, as judged by the number of patents, uh, sociologists have found that there are certain countries that, that consistently ha are very good at innovating and some that are much less good at innovating. And this is stable. It's not just, obviously, if you look in any one year, you're going to find some ranking you can make. But this is stable over 10, 20 years. It doesn't change that much because the mindset of one country is to follow the rules and, and stay within the lines. And, and the mindset of another country is to break out and, and to disrupt things here in America, disruption. That if you're in business, you want to be the disruptor. You don't want to be the disrupted. It's no longer OK in today's world to just build the best mousetrap and, and say, I have a successful company, and I'm just going to keep going this way. Because there's VCs everywhere trying to shoot you down with other approaches. Well, you even use these words. I'll quote it exactly. We like to set up challenges for ourselves and then invent ways to overcome them. It's almost as if then, are we doing this on purpose? That's what that statement we, means. We, we like puzzles, right? We like, we, you have crossword puzzles in the newspaper, Sudoku's. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, we, we, humans like uh, remnants of our past come in two, in two uh, categories. There is the physical, so we do sports because we're no longer running around the savanna trying to chase down our food, so we kick the soccer ball and run around the field doing that. And we do mental games because that's the other aspect of our being. And we like to set up challenges and to solve them. But now, the biggest challenge you say is, and I, and I want to get it right, to be successful today, we not only cope with the flood of knowledge and data that we know we're having to cope with, but we now have to be able to anticipate the future. It's no longer, that used to be live in the now, be here now, that was the way. But according to you, that almost is dangerous if you're only in the now. Now, I don't mean that on a psychological level. We all want to be in the now. I want to be in the now with you right now, you know, that, that sort of a way. But to a certain sense, we've got to be thinking and using foresight at this particular stage of history, probably more so than ever in the past. Certainly in business, the, the, if you look at the lifespan of a, for, a Fortune 500 company, uh, I think it was about 60 years, uh, 20 years ago, and now it's about 20 years. Uh, our, our ability to keep going the way you've been doing things is, is, is diminishing. And if you only react when, when someone else comes along with something better, but you're not constantly trying to improve yourself, you're going to get left behind. And you know, it's true in our personal lives too today. Uh, you, have to, you have to be in a, if you want to thrive, you have to constantly be in a position where when change happens and opportunities come along, you're, you're positioned to take advantage of that. Well, you even use this word. You say even better news. 
for us and our species is that not only do our genes help us cope with the new society, but our society can help shape our genes. Now we're getting down to that level of DNA, that society can actually affect our genes? Well, this is called epigenetics, that our, our genes can be affected by environmental factors. And as the environmental, uh, social environment changes, and as we react to that, that, that can affect our, our genes. And uh, some evidence shows that these epigenetic changes can even be passed down and inherited. Now, with that in mind, when you started originally in the beginning, you said that elastic thinking was really at a time reserved more for the thinkers, literally, the physicists, the scientists, the artists, the musicians. But you're now saying that if not every one of us, from the truck driver to the police officer to the garbage collector, if we're not all of us using this thinking, we are left behind where before we were able to survive and at least maintain, we will be literally left out of the loop even no matter what our profession is. Because if you look 100 years ago or even 40 years ago when society was much more stable, uh, the, the, the implements of our everyday lives weren't changing that quickly. Today, just to take a trivial example, you might get an update for your iPhone or a, a, or a new uh, version of uh, uh, operating system on your computer or a new version of some software that you're using or there might be some new social media that people start using. And we have to learn, we have to adapt, we have to learn how to, how to use that, how, how that works or you're going to get stuck. Uh, in all aspects of our lives, we have to, we, 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 as things change much faster, we have to be able to adapt and to change ourselves. And, and back when society was more stable, you didn't really need to do that. You could get along with the status quo with your routine. And so the only people who really invented things or had to really adapt to changes or, or whose livelihood and, or happiness, success depended on it were artists, physicists, uh, engineers who had to invent, people who had to invent new things. Uh, and all the rest of us who, who were just doing your job could, could pretty much coast. And that's not true anymore. Now, in our, our next episode, we're going to go into further, but I want to give a little hint right now because I think it's important just in case someone misses that next one as well. And that is the reluctance, though, for us to be flexible thinkers. It is somewhat ingrained within us. I, I think that we, we all have a great capacity for both elastic thinking and, and logical thinking. And I'm not saying that we need one over the other. I'm saying that we need both. And the elastic thinking hasn't, has not been emphasized enough in the past. But humans do not, uh, are not change averse. This is a myth that the, that the business, uh, businesses promulgate. And uh, the reason they do it is that change in, in the business world is often negative. Uh, a company gets reorganized or it gets bought, sold. Uh, often what happens to the employees is, is, is something bad. So if you're called into um, some, your boss's office and the, your boss tells you, uh, we're, we're striving to be more efficient, I need you to do 10% more work for the same money, or I'm going to... I'm going to cut back on your team, and you, instead of nine people, we're going to have seven people, then that's negative. And so uh, companies, uh, b uh, business school, business journals write about this change aversion and how to overcome employees' resistance to change. But if, you, if someone called you in as an employee and said, hey, we're doing a reorganization, and my company is striving to become less efficient, and we need you to do 10% less work for the same pay, you'd be happy. Or they said, you know, instead of having nine employees on you, we're going to hire two more for you, same amount of work. You'll get it done with 11 instead of nine. You'd go happy. Same degree of change. You like this one. You didn't like the other one. So humans are not change averse. They're just uh, averse to negative change, to more uncertainty, risk, or more work, less pay, losing their job. But in general, we, we, we love change. Uh, there's a variation amongst individuals. And, you know, in the book, I, I give a, a test where you can identify where you stand on that, on the neophilia or other, other dimensions of elastic thinking. And we're, they're all individual differences. But in general, the humans as a species love change.
On that note, Leonard, as you write, only we ourselves, through being mindful of how we operate, can choose the optimal practice for us to follow. Thank you, sir, for being, allowing us to be so mindful. Thanks, Barry. It was fun. My pleasure. And thank you all for joining us. In our next episode, Leonard and I will explore how to apply flexible thinking to give you the edge in this time of change. But for now, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Elastic. We may face many challenges, and sometimes they seem insurmountable. But the human brain, given time and nurturing, has solved countless of such problems. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all of our challenges, even if they seem insurmountable, give it that time and nurturing. And in our next episode, we'll learn how to meet that challenge head on. Thank you, Leonard. Thanks, Ken. My pleasure. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.